بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين was requested by some of the responsible brothers here in this masjid ويا ليت أبا الزرع وأبا حبس لم يخرجا يا ليتهما لم يخرجا It was requested that we answer some questions as it is the practice of Abu Sayfillah Abdul Qadir here. So that's what we're going to do inshallah. But before we take the questions, obviously, Aswani, you can't talk very much during the time of the khutbah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was eloquent in his speech and he was talking to people who were understanders of the language. So their khutbah used to be very short and the salat was very long because they understood. He had the ability to be eloquent and the people understood what he was saying. But now during our time because lack of knowledge, lack of the Arabs, even Arabs don't know the Arabic language that well. Because of that fact, the khutbah has to be, the kalam has to be long and the salat has to be relatively short. But there is a point that I wanted to mention, a number of points that could be mentioned but one of the points that we wanted to mention that dispels the myth that Al-Islam spread by the sword, meaning Rasulullah just, sallallahu alayhi wa indiscriminately just went and killed people, and if you went against his position or his opinion, he will kill you. Islam didn't spread like that. As a matter of fact, we have too many examples, like the one we mentioned today, the Islam of Umama. A brother just came to me and he said, what's his name? Your mama? His name is not your mama, not your mama, my mama, his mama, it's Umama. Umama. Ibn Uthal, radiallahu anhu. This is one of those examples of how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have chopped that man's head off and worked with him by al-adl, justice. But he worked with him as he worked with other people with al-ihsan and al-fadl. From this hadith, ikhwani, is that Thumama's people held back the wheat that they used to send to Mecca. And the people of Mecca were afflicted with a, a drought and they didn't have food to eat so they began to complain the people of Mecca are the people of Rasulullah and even though they are kuffar they are still his people and they are human beings Islam doesn't love the spilling of blood just for the sake of spilling of blood so they complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his enemies complained. And he saw what was going on and he raised the boycott. And he allowed the people of Yamama, the people of Fumama's people, he allowed them to send them grain, even though they boycotted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the beginning of Al-Islam. They kicked him out of his city. They killed his companion. They broke his tooth. They said he was a liar, a poet, a magician, and other than that. So that's something that the du'at in general specifically need to learn. People were given da'wah in Allah. We need to learn that. The people of the sunnah, the people of this da'wah, the salafiyah, they know the most, so they should know the most about Allah and this religion. And as such, they should have the most merciful towards the creation. Not making taqfir of people. Not making tabdir of people. Not being rough with people who don't deserve that type of treatment. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the beginning of this story to the end of this story, he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was a man of hikmah. He knew when to be shadeed and he knew when to be light. For you revert brothers and the non-revert brothers, some of you who used to not practice, but in particular you revert brothers because Fumama was a revert. Fumama had the niyyah prior to Islam of going to Mecca to perform the umrah, doing a good deed. And then he became a Muslim and he wanted to know, can I continue to do that good deed? This hadith shows us and it helps us understand that if you wanted to do a good deed prior to Islam or you used to do good deeds prior to Islam, like as a non-Muslim you were taken care of an orphan, as a non-Muslim you were taken care of a poor relative, as a non-Muslim you want to do something that comes under the umbrella of Islam. When you become a Muslim, you can continue to do that thing, especially if you had an oath, especially if you took an oath and that oath is permissible for you to execute. 
You have to continue to do the good deeds. Now, Islam does nothing, Ikhwani, except embellish the good character and what is already acceptable. The last thing that we want to mention before we open up the door of discussions is that the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to send food to Thumama. He used to send food to Thumama. As Ibn Ishaq brought with a narration that's authentic in his book of history, Rasulullah's family, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to send the food to Thumama. And Thumama used to eat, and he used to eat, and he used to eat. To the point that the Muslims found it very strange. Look how much that man eats. And then the Prophet told us the authentic and famous hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the kafir ya'kul fi sabah وَإِنَّمَا الْمُسْلِمْ يَأْقُلْ فِي مَعِ وَاحِدْ He told the people, the non-Muslim eats for seven stomachs. He overeats. Whereas the Muslim only eats for one stomach. That was the cause behind that particular hadith. The last thing that I want to mention, Ikhwani, to my Arab brothers who are here, to my Arab brothers specifically, but to all of us, is that even prior to Al-Islam, the Islam of Fumama, when Rasulullah Wasallam's Calvary caught Thumama, Thumama did not become apologetic about what he did in Jahiliya. He was a man, and he was powerful, and he stood behind what he did and what he said and what he believed in. Ya Muhammad, if you kill me, you would have killed someone who shed blood. And if you let me go, I'll be happy. I'll be thankful for what you did. And if you want to ransom me, I'll give you all the money that you want. As a non-Muslim, Thumama did not accept that he becomes a person who begs. Oh, Muhammad, give me my life, spare my life. Yeah, Muhammad, give me a break. He wasn't like that. In Jahili and Kufr, that's how the Arabs were back then. Now in Al-Islam, now in Al-Islam, the Arabs and the non-Arabs, Muslims in general, but the Arabs weren't like this in the past. In Al-Islam, the person embraces this religion and he's on the hot, he's on the correct deen. And then the kufa come and they blow on you. And the person starts to apologize for being a Muslim. He starts to apologize for being in this country. He's paying taxes. He's paying, what do they call it, council taxes. He's working, paying taxes. He's following the law. He doesn't have to apologize. We should let those people know that some of us, we're not going anywhere. We're here. This is our country just as much as the next man's country. And we're going to leave when we get ready to leave. Stop apologizing for being a Muslim. Hold on to your religion. Stop apologizing. And that's why I say the MCB and people like that, the Muslim Council of Britain, they don't speak for us, Ikhwani, when they go and they make the statements that they do. We cooperate with anyone, even now Muslims, on what Islam allows us to cooperate, or cooperate on. But we do not bend the rules of this religion and apologize. That's not the way that we want people to articulate what our position is in Al-Islam. So we take responsibility for what we're doing as Muslims and we take responsibility even of what our Shabab are doing. But we're not going to take all the responsibility of that, nor are we going to apologize for being Muslims or apologize for anything that that book says. And when we have people who are apologizing for any ayat or any ruling in that book, then know for a surety that person is on the way of destruction. So with that, Ikhwani, inshallah, we'll open the door now for any questions that you brothers may have right now concerning the khutbah al juma or other than that. If we know the answer, we'll answer. If not, then we'll give it to those who know. Alain de Pumshay. Akhuna. And then, Ikhwani, whoever doesn't ask a question, don't stop me on the way out, because I have to get out of here. Don't stop me, because people are shy to ask now, and then when I get out, they want to stop me. Everyone has a question. Tfadda ya'ah. In what way do you mean that the Tabiqi and the Razi Muslims have pushed people to the world? Like, it's the Muslims. That's a good question. Which way do I mean that Tabiqi Masjid, the Brawi Masjid, the Diobandi Masjid, what do I mean by they push people towards being fanatical and terrorists? 
First of all, before answering that question, let me be perfectly clear here. I'm about unity and loving the Muslims. I'm not like those people who ask questions like the hurricane in New Orleans. Were there any Salafi people in there? Any Salafi Muslims? And then the ones who are not Salafi, I don't care about them. No, we hate that any Muslim will be visited by any type of uh, problem, fitna, musiba, other than that. But we have to call it how we see it, especially now. How long are we going to continue to remain politically correct and not say what should have been said years ago to enlighten the Muslims about what this deen is? So what I meant by that is that when we don't teach the people the correct understanding of Al-Islam, Islam based upon the Quran and the Sunnah, the authentic Sunnah, according to the way that the companions understood those two sources, and not teaching people about the peer system. If someone dies, give me some money, just grease my palm. That hocus pocus deen of the Brewi, the hocus pocus religion of the peer, and the bird flew down on his shoulder, and the rays came from the sun, and the hand came out of the ground, and it gave him this, and it gave him that. That type of Islam and that understanding of Islam fabricated hadith, what is not from the religion, calling on other than Allah Azza wa all of that stuff. Not learning about what the religion is saying. If I'm traveling for 40 days, wherever I'm traveling, three days, five days, and I travel the distance where I can combine my prayers, shorten my prayers, the people don't want to do issues like that. So we're not talking about issues where there are ikhtilaf and it's an ikhtilaf that's permissible. We're talking about the basics of the religion. When the people don't teach the Muslim community the religion of Al-Islam, vacuums are created. And what happens? The radical people who talk well, who are brave, or they seem to be brave, they'll come and make irresponsible, crazy statements. So the young, impressionable youth hears it, and he says, that's Islam, that's jihad. And the next thing we know, he's on the underground tube, blowing himself up with someone else. That's what I mean. It's the responsibility of those messages to stop teaching the khutbah and the religion in the language that people don't understand. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ We have not sent a messenger except that he spoke the language of his people so that they would understand. So I can say, and I speak for most of the people here, when you're young and you have to come to the masjid, you come, you come. When you become 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and it's your choice and the parents give you your choice, the majority of you stop coming. Is that true or is that not true? true. Why? Because we can't relate to what the man is saying. We dread being coming to the masjid. So you find that person picking his nose, that one playing with his toes. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. That we are partly responsible for that, but the lion's share of the responsibility of radicalism and other than that, terrorism is because of the kuffar. That's my personal opinion. And you Uh, unity, Ikhwani, is based upon the Kitab and the Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions, وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold on to the rope of Allah all together and don't be divided. He said in the authentic hadith, Al-Qur'an huwa حَبْلُ اللَّهِ الْمَمْدُودِ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِنَ الْأَرْضِ The Qur'an is the rope of Allah that extends from the heavens to the earth. So we hold on to the Qur'an and the understanding of the Qur'an. أَلَا إِنِّي تَرَبْتُ فِيكُمْ أَمْرَيْنْ لَنْ تَدِلُّ مَا أَنْتَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا I left you people with two things, you'll never go astray as long as you hold on to them. The Qur'an and the Sunnah. Follow the way of my companions. Be united on the way of my companions. We're not talking about unity, empty slogan unity. I cannot, and I'll tell you this right now. I don't care who you are. If you are a Shiite from Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and you curse the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'll tell you from here, I cannot be united with you. All I can do is try to give you dawah and try to help you to understand. And if my mother came into the religion and she got on your side and I had one glass of water in the desert and it was just you and my mother needed that glass of water, I don't know if I'm going to give it to you too. Wallahi, I don't know. 
Someone may say, Abu Sama, but the hadith of Fumama, that's your mother. Those are the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how can you see that as a small issue? When someone sits there and he says, oh, this is division. Why is he saying this? This is making division. That's the division that's wajib. هُوَ الَّذِي أَيَّدَكَ بِنَصْرِهِ وَبِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ لَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ وَلَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ أَلَّفَ بَيْنَهُمْ Allah is the one, Ya Muhammad, who, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He helped you with this nasr, with this help. And He helped you with the believers. And it was Allah who brought their hearts together. Had you spent everything in the earth, Ya Muhammad, all of the money, and you gave the people money, they would have never been united. But Allah united them. How? He united us in that He is one ilah, face the same qibla, our aqidah is the same, getting in the roles of the salah. One deen, practicing the arkan of al-Islam, is unity. But what divides us is following other than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In our masjid today, the person is in the line, and it's time for the salat. In Sahih al-Bukhari, he used to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before the salat, لَتَسْوُنَّ صُفُوفَكُمْ أَوْلَا يُخَارِفَنَّ اللَّهُ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ If you don't straighten your line, Allah will cause your heart to be divided. Anas ibn Malik, as well as Al-Nu'man ibn Bashir, رضي الله عنهما, they used to say, when Rasulullah said that, we would put our ankle bones next to each other and our shoulders next to each other. That's a hadith you can show an individual. But that individual in the salah, in the saf, he'll stay with his feet apart, but he doesn't know why. If you ask him, why are you doing it? You ask him, why, why you don't put your feet together? He'll say, I don't know. Right now, no one is going to say, I know why. I'm going to keep talking, inshallah, and I'll continue. And no one here is going to say, I know why. I give them 500 pounds. If someone here can say, I know why we do that. Because they don't know why. It's just kalam from the madhab. So when we follow other than Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it leads to al-istiraq, al-ikhtilaf. When we follow these imams and these jama'at, that's what it leads to. So we're not talking about an open-ended unity, unity, unity. There are people you cannot be united with. Even if it happens to be your father, your brother, your mother, you can't be united with those individuals. And then there are people you have to be united with. So, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, I advise you to go back to read that hadith of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, al-Yaman, about the jama'at that appeared. Uh, someone in here, brother had glasses, he must have left. Naam, akhi, badr. Uh, concerning the 15th night of Sha'ban, we believe in that it has its virtues. And if a Muslim wanted to pray that particular night, it's permissible for him to pray. But he shouldn't pray that particular night thinking that he's been ordered to pray on that night or there's some special virtue in praying on that particular night. The strange thing is that those people use weak hadith to support what they want. And then that same weak hadith may have an aspect in it that they won't take that's from Islam. Like Allah comes down on the 15th of Sha'ban. And he says, is anyone praying on this night? Anyone seeking istighfar? Anyone doing this? Anyone doing that? So they use that fabricated hadith in order to show you can pray. But yet the part of the hadith that says Allah comes down from the sama. If you ask them where Allah is, then he has to come down. They say Allah is in every makan. Not acceptable to say that he is over his arsh as he's established in the Quran and the Sunnah. So those people, Ikhwani, who do the Shab Barat, we want to be students of knowledge, Ikhwani. The Muslims are ignorant. And please don't understand that I'm knowledgeable or we're better than them. No. But our Ummah, we don't know. Even the Shiite who curse the companions, many of them curse the companions and they don't know what they're doing. Many of them say what they say and they don't know what they're doing. So we have to have rahmah for them, we have to have patience, and we have to give them da'wah. We don't make takfir even of the Shia, who's not from the ulama. As for the ulama, we make takfir of them. Khomeini is a Catholic, because he got knowledge. As for those regular people in Iraq and Iran and other than that, we don't make takfir of them. So in this issue, it's an innovation, shabbarat. Those scholars from the tabi'in and after them who said it could be done, like al-imam al-awza'i. 
They said that you should do it, pray by yourself, in the privacy and the confines of your own home, and not in the jama'at as it is being done today. And we even reject that from Al-Imam Al-Uzai, who was the one who said about the hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَتَّلَعْ إِلَى جِمِيعِ خَلْقِهِ فِي لَيْلَةِ النَّصْرِ مِنْ شَعْبَانِ فَيَغْفِرُ كُلَّ خَلْقِهِ إِلَّا لِمُشْرِكٍ أَوْ مُشَاهِدٍ Allah looks at his creation on the 15th night of Sha'ban and will forgive everyone from this creation except a mushrik and a mushahid. The mushahid is the two Muslims who have problems with each other. And Imam al-Uzai said, this is talking about the mubtadi. So Imam al-Uzai who said it's permissible shabbarat, he didn't allow those type of innovations. And another thing, people put so much emphasis on the rice, the sweet rice, the candy, the halawa, candles, bukhur, turn the lights off in the masjid, but they have standing and ongoing problems with their father, their mother, their brother, their sister, their sister-in-law, their brother-in-law, and they don't make any peace on that night. What's the benefit of this salah? And other than that, Allah doesn't forgive those two people. So what the person should do is preoccupy himself with those issues that are going to be benefiting. So if we found those people making ikhtilaf with us, there were greater scholars before us who took that position. Ibn Taymiyyah said some things that would suggest that he believed in that. But his student, Al-Imam Ibn Qayyim, rejected that. Ibn Rajab rejected that as we rejected it. So it shouldn't be done. Now, my son, Akhuna. Concerning the condition with many of our elders, especially from the Asian community, but this is not unique to them. Many times, they have been taught by the peer and by the peer system that they shouldn't try to learn the religion. Just rely on what has been related to you by the peer and other than the peer. So the parent may say, you can't take directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. That's the job of a scholar. You can't do that. We're not going to accept what you were saying. We reject that altogether. Because the religion of Islam is a religion that came to people with ummiyun. They were illiterate. They couldn't read and write. The Prophet told us, as we mentioned today, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, balligu anni wa ayah. Everyone tell about me, even if it's only an ayah. Whoever, whoever, man ra'a minkum munkara, fal yughayyirhu. Whoever from amongst you sees an evil thing, then let him change it with his hand, with his tongue, with his heart. Whoever. If this statement was true, then we would always have to wait to go to the scholar to say, Hey, peer, hey, scholar, is this a munkar? Is that a munkar? And then he says, yes, go and change it. That's ludicrous. But there is a tad of truth in that. There are certain issues that are for the ulama, jihad, takfir. Those are the big issues. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, one of the ulama, that Thumama saw in the masjid teaching the Muslim. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, لا يزال الناس بخير ما أتاهم العلم عن أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأكابرهم فإذا أتاهم العلم عن أصاغرهم هلكوا The people will always be okay. This ummah, the people will be okay as long as the knowledge came to them from the companions of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and their ulama. Not the young people. And if the knowledge comes to them from the young people, from the deviants, from the, non, the ones who don't qualify, then they're going to be destroyed. So that has some truth in it, a tad of truth. Stay away from the major issues. Stay away from those ahadith that have some ishkal. And there are only a few. Where would you read it and it appears as clear, but it doesn't really mean that. There are only a few that are like that. But the religion of Islam is a religion that is easy to understand. And that is from the brainwashing and the conditioning of the Asian peer system. The hocus pocus Islam. The crystal ball Islam. If you want to pass the test, if you want to make someone love you, if you want to do black magic or get it off of you, if you want to do your driver's license, if you want to bring her love back, then just call Sheikh Ahmed, the universal one who... This is the Asian Islam. I'm not against the Asian community, Ikhwani, so don't sit there and be narrow-minded. But this is the conditioning that has happened to us. She's going to read the Quran, she has to put a hijab over her head. 
She's at home. She has to put the thing over her head. She has to follow with her right hand. If she, with her right finger. One finger. Not the left finger. The right finger. If she doesn't, the people say, what are you doing? You can't read the Quran like that. That's that traditional Islam and Khwani that is backwards that your father, your grandfather, your great grandfather back in Nirpur, back in Azad Kashmir. I'm not trying to be funny, Khwani. In the frontiers, they couldn't read and write. That was the best that they could do. They couldn't read and write. So they relied on the peer, having husn of one in the righteous natures of the peer. But you can't do that anymore. You have to learn your religion for yourself, and we have to educate them. So take it easy with them and bring them up to a certain level, and that's not going to happen overnight. Be gentle and understand their situation. Fadda'akhi. Mm. I just want to see what kind of students are here in Luton. Uh, you, what's wrong with, what's your name? Shaquille. Be a man, Shaquille. What's wrong with a sister putting something over her head and being told to follow the Quran with her right finger, her right index finger? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, we can use a delil from the Qur'an and we can say that Allah Azza said in the Qur'an Whoever exalts the institutions of Allah that's a proof of the taqwa that's in his heart. So from the institutions of Allah is the qibla, safa and marwa, uh, the masjid, the adhan, uh, all of those are from the institutions of Islam. So if someone says, Shaquille, don't sit towards, with your feet towards the Qibla. I don't have any delil that will make him stop doing that. But the Qibla is from the institutions of Islam. We don't urinate towards it. We don't defecate towards it. We don't spit towards it. So as a token of respect, if you put your legs in, this is part of the respect. The problem comes when I come and say, Shaquille, Allah said, Rasulullah said, this is the deen. And then when he says, I get mad at him. I say, don't come in and smash shit. I break off. I don't. And that's what happened with the old lady who said, you got to put this on, you got to do that. The sister said, no, I don't have to do that. Where's the proof of that? And she got mad at her and started talking to the other old ladies in their language. That's the problem. And you say, you have to do that. Good job, Shaquille. Because he understood what the knee, what my intent was. Good job, man. Anybody have any halawa? I want to give the one who answered the right question. I want to give him a gift. Anybody have any halawa? Tfadda ya akhi. Ahsan Allah ilaykum. Can I get one? Naam. In the Muslim countries and between the sufuf of the Muslims wherever you go, we have this idea and this concept of separating the religion and the masjid separating church and state. I always forget the translation of that word. What is that again? Secularism. The deen is one thing and the life is something else and they should be separated. What's the position of Al-Islam concerning that? Is that something that's consistent with the religion of Al-Islam? We say, if someone believes that and someone buys into this secularist concept, that's kufrun. Kufrun, bawahi, clear kufr. Not that he's a kafir, but to think that is kufrun. It is disbelief. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the religion, and the religion of Al Islam is complete, and it takes over every aspect of the life. Abu Darda, Abu Dar al Ghaffari radiallahu anhu said, Ma tara ta'iru. ما طار طائر في السماء فحرق جناحيه إلا ذكر لنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم منها علما. He said the bird would not fly in the sky. A bird wouldn't take off and fly in the sky except that Rasulullah told us some wisdom and knowledge about that bird. Everything we need, how to slaughter the bird, how not to slaughter the bird. If you kill the bird out of target practice, the bird will come Yomul Qiyamah and say, Ya Rab, salhu, nima 
The bird is going to say, Omu Kiyama, oh Allah, ask him, why did he kill me? He took him for target price. Rasulullah taught us that. How to slaughter him. How not to slaughter him. How not to make superstition. If he flies to the right, I'll do it. If he flies to the left, I won't do it. The Yahudi, the Yahudi came and he wanted to put Salman al farisi down by blowing on his religion. He said, لَقَلْ أَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ كُلِّ شيء. Your Nabi taught you people everything. Being sarcastic. Having his that. One of us today, if the Yahudi would have said that, we would have said, yeah, I'm sorry, Dad. Yeah, I'm sorry. But maybe he didn't teach us everything. Salman al farisi your grandfather who comes from Persia, your great great grandfather, he said, Ajal, Lakad Alamana Qada al Haja. That's right. He taught us how to go to the bathroom. He taught us that one of us should not take and clean himself with his right hand. And that we shouldn't face the qibla when we go to the bathroom. And that we shouldn't clean ourselves with less than three rocks. And we shouldn't clean ourselves with the dry dung of animals. Strong on his deen. Taught us how to go to the bathroom. You think he didn't teach us everything? Politics. Kana bani Yisrael yususum anbiya'um kuluma halaka nabiyun khalafuhu nabi. Bani Israel, their NBI used to take care of their politics. Every time a prophet would die, another prophet would come. The deen took care of the politics. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُشْرِكُونَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ That's our religion. Good question. Any more questions, Ikhwani? قَبَلَ النَّمْصَرَفَ فَضَّلَ the meaning of the people in this country is it halal? This is an issue of ikhtilaf. We have to look at the issues of al ikhtilaf and we have to be students of knowledge and we have to come to learn how to deal with issues of ikhtilaf and how to weigh issues. Fifteen people come to one of our classes, eight, nine people, where are the rest of the people at? And Ikhwani, whether you realize it or not, the particular class that you're going to take tonight, tomorrow, where only 15 people are coming, you may know everything about what is being spoken about in the class. But when you're consistent and persistent in the classes, other things are developed inside of you. Like the ability to weigh the masalih and the masasid. You get trained how to do that simply by allowing yourself to get exposed to classes. So when an issue like this is an issue of ikhtilaf, some major scholars said that it was permissible from the past and now. And they have authentic proofs from the Quran. اليوم أحلن لكم الطيبات وطعام الذين أوتوا الكتاب حلن لكم وطعامكم حلن لهم They ask you today, all of the good things are made permissible for you. The meat, the food of those people who are given the book before you is permissible for you and your meat is permissible for them. Aisha رضي الله عنها came with some meat. She said, Ya Rasulullah, this meat was given to me by two people from Al Kitab, here in Medina, from Al Awali, a place in Medina. He didn't ask, what do they believe? How do they slaughter? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sammi la alayha wa kuli. You say Bismillah over it and eat it. And other than that, so is Shaykh ibn Usaymin, and other than him, Rahimullah Ta'ala, said it's permissible for us to eat their meat. Morrison, Mickey D's, Burger King, these other places. If you know there's no pork and other stuff mixed in it. The person may say, but Morrison's may be owned by a Sikh, or maybe owned by a Buddhist, or McDonald's may be owned by a Sikh. They're not from al Kitab. But those scholars said, no, the hukum is for the Aghlabiyya. The rules goes according to the majority of the people living here, the al Kitab. When they open up their debate, in their Congress or Parliament, whatever it is, they have the Queen sing there along with the Bible. When they want to make a Muslim leader from the MCB, the Sir, whatever he's going to be, a knight, he hits the, she hits him in the head with that thing and the Bible is there. She may ask, let me put the cross on your neck. This is their religion, so that's the hukum. It's ikhtilaf. But ikhwani, listen. We are in a place where halal meat, the bihami, is easily accessible. So we have to weigh the situation. 
Why would I make kuffar stronger when I don't have to make them stronger? Why forsake my brother when I can make his business stronger? Da'ma yuribuka ila mala yuribuka. I'm not sure. It's an issue of ikhtilaf. So let me leave what I doubt that me for what I don't doubt. And I'm clear, I'm safe. So you learn that when you learn the religion. You learn that when you learn how to start weighing. If I see my son in McDonald's and Burger King, my daughter in McDonald's and Burger King, I'm going to look at him, going to make him feel something is wrong with this. But I'm not going to say that to the ummah. I'm not going to say that because how are we going to make tight what Allah didn't make tight that the ulama had ikhtilaf about. So I believe that is permissible, but it should be avoided. You should save your religion, have a level of wara, awareness. Leave that shubahat. Anything else, ikhwani? A person is given dawah in a particular place, in a particular area, and then he leaves that area. So what can he do in order to ensure that the dawah that he was talking about and calling to will remain? Because in his absence, other people can come in and the system can change. The Arab poet said in one of the beautiful lines of poetry that deal with this particular issue, كيف يتم البنيان يوم تمامه إذا كنت تبني وغيرك يهتم How is the building ever going to become complete if you were building and someone else comes and knocks it down? Every time you put a wall up and you're on to the next wall, someone else comes and knocks the other walls down. How is it? The building, the structure will never reach its full potential. So what does the person do? First of all, he only can do what Allah has given him the ability to do. Part of the tawfiq of his dawah is him having ikhlas and making dua to Allah and asking Allah to keep that dawah remaining. That's part of the tawfiq of Allah In issues like this, all the person can do, Akhi, is just to try to cover his bases to the best of his ability. But ultimately, once he leaves, he has to ensure that the person who's taking his place or leaves behind people who are on the similar page at what he's on. He can only do what is within his ability. Fattaqullaha mastata'atum. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. Ma amartukum bihi fa'tu minhu mastata'atum. Whatever I ordered you to do, do the most of it as you can do. So Allah said about the religion, saddidu wa qaribu. Do your best. To hit the bullseye. Do your best. You're not the one who's responsible for the wind that's going to come and it may blow the arrow off course. Some ant, something gnawing at the target. As soon as you get ready to shoot, target falls over when you shoot. So you miss. All of those extracurricular activities going on, you don't have anything to do with that. But you have the bow and you have the strength. So do your best. To try to hit the bullseye. Ma rameita is rameita. Back in Allah Rama, Ya Muhammad, before the battle started and you threw the sand in the eyes, you didn't throw that sand. Allah threw the sand. You picked it up and you threw it, but Allah made it hit the people. All you have to do is do something. But ultimately, the tawfiq is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any more questions? Ikhwatifillahi. Last thing that I want to mention, Ikhwani, I can't impress upon all of you. Enough, the importance of learning the religion of Al-Islam. There's a place for this type of talk, and that is on Friday. Khutbah motivates you, makes you inspired, makes you want to do more in the religion. But every class cannot be like that. That's not how you learn this religion, by being pumped up and feeling good. That's Christianity. The only part of Christianity going to church that we used to like was when they played the music. Because it's so good. Everybody liked music. So we swung with the groove. We liked it. But when it came time for that preacher appealing to our intellect, asking he revert here. We would say, what is he talking about? What is he going on about? And God was the blood and the blood became the lamb and the lamb became the sun and the sun tipped over and his feet were dangling. What did I learn from that? Blood, lamb, the sun. What is that? That's how they talk. I don't encourage anyone to watch them, but any of them that you see, that's how they talk. Our religion is knowledge. You have to go systematically, you have to have a minhaj. Go through the books of fiqh, the Arabic language from A to Z. 
That's our religion, ikhwan. Memorize the Qur'an. Don't be like these people you want to pick up knowledge here and there. From this tape, this khutbah, that statement. La. You have to buckle down and learn this religion. If you don't do that, your knowledge will forever remain like Swiss cheese. Cheese with holes in it. You know some things, but it's holes all over the place. You'll never be able to make a perfect sandwich. You'll never be able to bring it together. You got to make an effort to bring it together. So we're going to stop here and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive us for any of the mistakes that we have made and for our transgressions in the deen and that he makes us of those people who are the people of Ahlul Hadith, Haqqan, Salukan, Wa Minhajan, Wa Aqidatan, Wa Ibadatan, and other than that. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. No questions, Ikhwani. Let me go right out. Alright? Assalamu alaikum.